Welcome back to this afternoon session. Um, just a quick look, how was lunch? Very good, yes, okay. Yeah, very good, okay. Thank you so much for showing up again for this afternoon session, which promises to, to be very interesting. Um, we are talking to the two authors of the book, The Consultative, and the topic of discussion is Opportunities and Limits for Transformation to Sustainability, Social Justice, and Survival of Democracy. The English version of the book, The Consultative, is forthcoming and will appear in the next few months, I think. So we'll get some first-hand insights uh, from that book, from the two authors. And just to present them very briefly to you, um, here on my right is Patricia Nantz. Uh, she is the Managing Scientific Director of the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies, IASS in Potsdam, and also a co-chairwoman co of the science platform Sustainability 2030. And Klaus Legevi, he is a professor of political science and co-director of the Center for Global Cooperation of the University of Duisburg, Essen. And actually, as a moderator, I love this session because they will have the dialogue between themselves, and I will just jump in after that and give you the opportunity also to interact with the panel. Thank you. Yeah. Klaus. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, it's very good to talk to you about a problem we have, we face right now. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, Mrs. Merkel had to fight for her survival this morning in the parliament, and the question is, you might think about, is it important for us or not? And I think it's very important what happens in the parliament. And our point will be um, that a major problem for democracy today is the, uh, the gap between uh, the parliamentary system, the so-called elites, the political elites, uh, um, and uh, the uh, yeah, parties uh, the, who govern uh, Germany, France, the EU since uh, decades now, um, and uh, a broader spectrum of um, people who either are uh, rather skeptical about what the elites are doing or are, in a way, um, urging them to do more. To, uh, to, to, progress, to, pro to, to bring progress to democracy. And um, our point will be that there is a kind of anti-institutional anti uh, heritage in uh, the progressive movement. And I think, we think, this is rather problematic. So we will have to build a bridge between this uh, extra parliamentarian milieu to avoid anti uh, any kind of uh, resentments against representative democracy and to bring uh, these two spheres together. That doesn't mean business as usual, not at all. Uh, politics as usual have to change a lot, uh, but it means that we should uh, refrain from a, a simply a simple uh, anti-institutional bias. This comes from the 60s, as I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so I, I know what democratization meant at that time. It meant democratization of everything. So this was not just the university. It was not just uh, politics. Uh, it was not just the churches, the companies, the university. It was everything, the professions. Everything had to democratize. And this was rather good. This brought a lot of progress to the political systems in, in Europe. Mm, but on the other hand, there was a kind of anti-institutional bias. Uh, so the extra-parliamentarian opposition in Germany called APO, APO, um, had a strategy that was not just extra-parliamentarian, but was in, uh, in, a, in a broad spectrum anti-parliamentarian. So uh, there were a lot of books out there. In a way, if you like, if you're just a name dropping, Carl Schmidt from the left. And this was a problem. Uh, so there was a democracy, uh, democracy, a def a, a, a democracy deficit even within the uh, new left. Uh, the dream of uh, the uh, the those who came from the 60s was, of course, a kind of grassroots democracy with councils. Uh, so the, the idea was already present. Uh, mostly then, at that point, very traditionalist socialist uh, councils. Nevertheless, and, and this is how history works, uh, there was a kind of switch to a what, what was called later um, uh, by scholars, but also by uh, the actors themselves, the participatory revolution. 
It meant uh, that uh, democracy was not, no longer what the elites did, what parliament did, what parties did, what it was what the citizens themselves did. And it was a broad development of uh, citizen empowerment. And this is the good heritage of the 70s and 60s and 70s. And in that regard, there was a kind of unfolding of all kinds of participation. Yeah, so in the 90s, you had uh, lots of um, participatory um, formats w which came along, uh, like, for example, uh, the um, uh, budget, the participatory budget in um, Porto Alegre and, and elsewhere, and many other forms, uh, like the Planungszelle and uh, Wisdom Councils and so, so on and so forth. So you had a sort of an explosion of, of participation around the world. In fact, uh, at the beginning of, the, of, the, of this century, we built um, a wiki platform called Participia Net, where you can see around the world uh, where these sort of concrete uh, projects took place and how they took place. Um, uh, nevertheless, you can also see that there's some sort of, of, of participatainment, how um, Klaus Zeller uh, of uh, Professor in Aachen calls this, namely the fact that many of, of these uh, experiments um, were sort of a, a placebo in the, in the sense that they didn't have any effect and they were not taken up by their decision makers and uh, so they were sort of uh, uh, you, they were there also for, for keeping the, the people sort of content, but without lots of effect. And one of the problem uh, you can see is that there were no, no institu institutionalization of these experiments. So there is no connection of, of participation to the institution. As Klaus Legowie said, uh, if you want to have an effect, you need a, um, a bridge between a broad participation and the political institutions. Uh, so, uh, ten years later, you find some, some forms of um, very broad um, ways of trying to find an institutional way of, of, of making them more effective. For example, in cities like Heidelberg and Leipzig and Bonn, um, they try to have some sort of um, lines and principles uh, so that the municipalities uh, have um, a sort of a procedure how these participation uh, procedures feed into the political processes. But they're more at the level of, of cities. At the level of region, you find in Tuscany uh, a law which links participation to um, the political sphere and also in Vorarlberg where it's even in the constitution. But these are very sort of preliminary ways and they're not uh, sort of changing the whole system. So still we have the prob problem that you have participation, but you see also all these sort of uh, placebo and, and uh, uh, sort of fake, uh, fake participation as well. Um, so the question is how to reform uh, and how to rethink democracy from the future because what I would like to add to, to Klaus Legebi's um, introduction is that uh, if you look at the um, history uh, and the, of the last 40 years of democracy, you also another sort of theme comes in um, from the 90s onwards, namely untractable problems at the global level or questions of sustainability. So from, uh, from Rio onwards, you had this uh, strong idea that uh, you should sort of also uh, tackle um, problems of sustainability at, at global level, but also at national level, at local level. And now we have the so-called SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, which we have to implement. And there might be a tension between the traditional way of all our democracy, how it functions now, and sustainability. Because um, democracy is, as it's often understood, it's really about um, trying to make a balance of power, balance of different parties, and having a, a sort of open openness towards, um, towards the solutions and uh, towards measurements, and also a ver reversibility. And, and for many, um, reasons, it's rather short-term oriented, you know, legislature is this sort of four years or five years uh, periods are very sort of uh, structuring the political process uh, and having the sort of little, little common denominator as a result of many of these compromises, uh, they won't move to actions we need for a sustainable future. So there might be some sort of tension between democracy, how it works now, and um, and sustainability, which is future-oriented, which has uh, intergenerational justice at the core, uh, and where we need to define common goals and then implement them. So the question would be how to reformulate democracy where it could you know, fit to make uh, sustainable societies possible. Yeah, 
but then, uh, then something else happened, uh, two things. One is uh, that particularly young people lost trust in democracy. If you look at the book of Yasha Mung and others, you will see that there is a generational degrade uh, of degradation of the acceptance, the legitimacy of democracy. So the young uh, age cohorts are less confident towards uh, parliamentary representative or other forms of democracy. Um, this is what happened, and I can understand this fully, because in that sense, democracy doesn't deliver to youngsters in Europe all over. There is a, a lack of uh, output legitimacy for democracy. But uh, the question is, of course, or the problem is that this also diminishes input uh, legitimization by young voters. On the other hand, what you have is a, uh, a reformulation of this desire for participation or of the or a perverse in the, uh, the participatory revolutions by anti-elitist populist or uh, uh, um, ethno-nationalist movements all over the world. This is the situation we're in. I don't have to define this any, uh, to elaborate on that. There is an identitarian variety uh, of a, a concept of, of democracy, which um, almost immediately turns into autocracy. I traveled through Poland uh, for um, 10 days, and uh, you can really watch as, as a kind of living, uh, life experiment what happens if institutions are destroyed, like the justice system, the media, science, uh, all that, and you can, it, it's, it's like a, a work in progress, Peace and others are doing. They're really destroying the institutions and that uh, makes, it, makes them even more important to us. So institutions have to be defended. Institutions are uh, uh, kind of uh, worth to fight for them. There are three branches, if you like, of critique of democracy in the moment. One is formulated by Jason Brennan. I don't know if you read the book. This is the epistocracy. Only those who know should govern, which is, of course, a Platonian idea. Um, and uh, we can uh, gloss over. Um, then there is an interesting book by Raybrook about the aleatory uh, um, uh, uh, aspect of democracy, I think this is only a medium, not the content of what democracy is about. So people are chosen to make the representative spot a, a bit more representative, but it's not uh, los verfahren, aleatory uh, um, um, mechanisms are not democracy uh, itself. And this is, uh, if, whenever he, he speaks, and he spoke, for example, to the President of the Republic a, a couple of weeks ago, so he's, he, he kind of is perceived as, as, uh, as someone who brings a new concept of democracy. It's just an instrument, it's not the content. But there is another uh, movement right now uh, to enlarge direct democracy to, uh, to, 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 uh, in, in a very plebiscitarian form. And uh, we have to admit that the two of us are very critical towards this uh, movement of um, uh, grassroots democracy in terms of direct democracy. We have nothing against uh, decision taking, direct decision taking on the local level. But we know from uh, direct democratic uh, procedures, for example, uh, in California since the 90s, uh, in Switzerland for the recent 15 years or so, how much these kind of direct dem democratic procedures can be manipulated, can be, uh, can be taken over by uh, strong right-wing populist uh, entrepreneurs uh, like Blocher or uh, Californian uh, billionaires. So uh, this is not just uh, a, a minor uh, um, uh, thing about uh, this. So the real thing that we think, and this is uh, why we wrote this book, is of course deliberative or as we would say consultative democracy. Shall I go on talking? Okay. <laughs> we need to learn what do you okay, mean so by that? consultative, <laughs> in our view, would be the um, all the uh, the sphere of participation which is already going on. So it would be the networks of all the participatory um, procedures already in place, and we think it could be a fourth branch or fourth power called the consultative. Uh, by the way, we think it's consultative, so it's not decisive. The people don't decide. 
um, but they consult. Yeah? But within this, uh, we think that in order to, uh, to make uh, democracy also future-oriented and to, uh, to fight against short-termism of, of politics, we um, sort of established or we um, conceived of a, a certain uh, format called the Future Council. Yeah? The Future Council is um, a gremium, a, a bunch of people, um, uh, chosen by lot, um, and it, in German it's the Zukunftsrat, and it would be, depending on where it's placed, either uh, within a municipality or at the level of a region or even federal or even beyond, between 15 and 40 people. Uh, they would get some sort of forms of allowances and, and would be in office for around two years, but all this is just, uh, you know, how we perceive it can also be sort of um, changed uh, towards the situation you are in. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, it has to um, work uh, and, and come up together, uh, perhaps at the beginning moderated, uh, with long-term issues which they have, have to be tackled at whatever level, political level there is. Yeah? Uh, so it's very much future-oriented and it's about the big questions. It's not about small questions. It's not about the road uh, on the left hand or the right hand. It's rather uh, what to do with nuclear waste uh, in a certain region, for example, or um, questions of um, how the uh, refugees would change uh, the long-term perspective of a region and you know, the, the, the social cohesion and questions like that, not, not sort of nitty-gritty little policy questions. Um, so um, the important thing is that it would open up at one point towards the broader public and that there is a necessary link between the representatives and the recommendations which came out, uh, out of, uh, of this um, future council. Meaning that they have to state what they do with those recommendations, whether they change their policies or not, and if not, then why. So they, there's a certain pressure uh, on the representatives. And so this would be one example to sort of bring uh, sort of different avenues and, and different alternative views on how to tackle problems into the political system uh, and also much more long-term and intergenerationally um, conceived because the, um, the people, I think that we, we, we said it, that we could start with, uh, at 14 uh, years, so that's the first uh, age of politicization, so that it's secured that within this uh, gremium, this group of people, it would be very diverse in terms of age, gender, um, and also education. Uh, so this would be one way of sort of bringing pressure towards the political system to think about more long-term questions and to bring in the people's voice. Of course, we think of it in, as a sort of a network, uh, so that if there are many sort of future council at different levels, you would really establish a, a quite powerful way of the people to voice and to come up with, uh, to, to, to sort of tackle their own uh, problems. So that it would also uh, serve to, um, to the cohesion because what we lack uh, in democracy is uh, um, some sort of strong vision of, of political community because of many different kinds of individualization problems and so on and so forth. So it w people would talk together which usually don't talk uh, in, at the public, in the public sphere. So it would, at one hand, uh, it would come up with uh, solutions to long-term problems, and this, on the second hand, it would contribute to the capacity building and empowering of the people and, uh, and to the social cohesion of uh, a political community. Thank you, that's highly interesting. One question that arose in my mind is, if you choose people by lot to be part of this um, council, how do you ensure that they're capable of treating these long-term questions because you need experts for that as well. Um, is that really a good way to, to, to have missionary politics in the future? Um, in my I have lots of experience about uh, a similar way of, of, of format, namely the Wisdom Council in Vorarlberg, not only in Vorarlberg, which function in a similar way. Yeah? So you may have to make sure that the, the problems are sort of um, defined by the people themselves. So you, you make sure that they're not, you know, questions that has nothing to do with their lives. So you have to, because even if the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, are very empty and abstract, if they are not sort of implemented and concretely lived in a certain municipality, for example. So um, it always has to do with their own sort of um, political environment. And 
of course, my experience is that people, um, that there is a sort of a trickling up uh, effect if, if diverse people start to discuss. Yeah? It's not a trickling down, but a trickling up effect. So the best way of thinking about this is, is what I, my experience is, if it's well done, the biggest common denominator of roses and not the smaller common denominator. And the biggest common denominator is already quite something. There might be some questions, for example, uh, nuclear waste disposal, where it's also questions about risk and so on, where there could be hearings or something like that of experts. So it's not, we don't have anything against hearings of experts, but they shouldn't be the ones within these uh, um, councils. Would you force people to, p to be part of these councils if they're chosen by lot? No, they can refrain. Uh, it's, it's a completely voluntary action. So there will be a problem uh -huh. that you have this uh, lot, uh, in, uh, lot procedure and many people who wouldn't uh, participate on a voluntary basis would also refrain when they are chosen by lot. And so you have to convince them, this is the first point, uh, what are we doing? And, this, and then the second point is that you can still uh, kind of re, uh, f reiterate uh, the procedure. We are not uh, heading for, a, let's say, a perfect representation of the community where the future council is based, but we would like to make them more representative as parliaments are. Mm -hmm. or most uh, Ortsbeiräte uh, uh, city councils are. So um, we are heading for a more representative thing and there will be always a bias. There will be a, bi a bias against gender, there will be one against youth, there will be against uh, uh, what is called migration background in Germany. So there will be still a certain distortion of that. But nevertheless, we, we, are, we have interesting experiences with these, these kinds would of you, Would you pay people? Um, yeah. to, to be part of it, because as a working class yeah. mother, uh, you yeah. can't just go there for a day. And no, no, we, we would, we would uh, think about uh, an allowance, uh, a general allowance. But back to the question you just mm -hmm. asked, um, uh, there, is, there are experiences about this, and the question of mobilization is serious. It's difficult to mobilize people who are perhaps who are even afraid of you know, discussing, and it's not in their habit. Uh, so it's a question of how to address them. And there's lots of experience around the world how to frame this kind of invitation. Who is inviting them if you go to youth um, groups or something like that? So you, you can do something about it, but it's a lot of work. Uh, so it's not something very easy to make, but we, we aim at a very diverse group in terms of education, age, and in particular to age, and uh, education, age, and gender, right? I come from Switzerland, so from the country with direct democracy, and my fear would be that you're exactly establishing a form of fake participation, a form of uh, placebo for democracy, as you were mentioning, because these recommendations, they don't need to be taken into account. That's the strength of direct democracy, that it's deciding on matters for the future, and it's not just giving recommendations. Yeah, but there is a, there's an obligation of the, for example, the city council to deal with the, the, the proposals. And this is not just okay, we read it, we appreciate it. Uh, as it happened to um, us speaking to politicians, they were all shoulder clapping and saying it's a very good idea with <laughs> yeah. the future council. <laughs> we will not do it, it's too costly, and by the way, it's anti parliamentarian. No, no, there is, a, there is the obligation for the legislative and exec executive branch to take it up. And there is also a kind of reiterative uh, um, a procedure. If this is not done within, let's say, six months, it has, it has to be. So this is, if you like, the, the, the major advantage of what we call institutionalization. It's in the, it's in the, in the rules of a, of a community. It has to be done. Uh, you, you, uh, you can gloss over, over everything for, that comes from the people. But here is a strange, uh, is a strong, not strange, a strong obligation mm. to put that on the agenda. Yeah. And also, um, the experience in Fallback and also in Bavaria, they, they have experience like that for 25 years, where you can show that, because it needs time, but one, uh, once it's established, first of all, the politicians are very happy about these ideas, uh, and they don't see it as a competition to their own uh, legitimation. And second of all, um, I think it, it, it's also important to, to uh, mobilize the public sphere because within the, the Future Council, we have also inbuilt 
that they go out and, and they talk about them. They're not, you know, a closed shop for two years. So uh, what we aim at is not only to have these councils, but that we would mobilize sort of um, progressive social movements, uh, people who are not within this uh, gremium, parties and so on, to have a strong voice and to enable and capacitate representative politicians. Because what I feel is that politicians don't believe in themselves anymore. They don't believe in politics. Hmm. This is one of the problems. So how to make pressure to representatives is to give a very clear voice to what you think would be a good future. Uh, so it's, it's rather strengthening uh, um, the democracy rather than weakening it with, you know, uh, with participation or what have you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to ask you, what's your stance? Very brief statements from, from the audience. How do you feel about the, uh, the idea of future councils? Do you think it's a good idea? Could they be a complement uh, to the current institutions we have? A fourth branch? Yes. Uh, the microphone is coming. Thank you. Kaya Landsberg, Hattie Foundation. Um, I think it's a great idea, but I would love to learn more about it. I, I didn't read your book. So if you could give us maybe some really explicit examples from Vorarlberg or one of the cities you mentioned um, to, to grasp it a bit better, because now as an idea, I think it sounds really fantastic, but um, not sure how it actually works in, in yeah i can tell you one of the last um, um so-called wisdom council in Vorarlberg. um by the way by constitution if thousand uh, citizens want such a council they can have it so they can ask for it uh, so they had the problems as in germany um, that they had a flood of immigrations coming and they didn't know what to do with it uh, and how this would alter a very sort of homogeneous place like Vorarlberg, it's at the border to Switzerland, uh, um, quite homogeneous uh, sort of uh, region of, of Austria. And um, it wasn't about what to do with the housing and sort of practical problems, it was the long-term perspective, what it would do with the society. So uh, they had, uh, by lot, they chose um, I think it were 18 or, or 19 people. Also, by the way, two um, refugees, yeah, young refugees. And, but they also at one point opened it up to all the different organizations dealing with them, Caritas and the churches and so on and so on. And the interesting thing is that the effect of, of then it, they open up to the public and then the, the minister, the president of this region came and so on and so forth. So it, you, you couldn't, you know, look, uh, not sort of uh, take it into account what came out of this. But the interesting thing is that it, it sort of began to integrate different people who are dealing with this problem. So it was not only, uh, uh, they not only came out with solutions, uh, how, how, this would, how this would influence the social policy, the educational policy, and so on and so forth, but they also brought together different agents, state agency, which otherwise don't talk to each other. You know, there's a lot of problems about, you know, sectorial ways and, and different silos who don't talk to each other. And this is a big problem for steering for global and, and complex issues, yeah? So they really brought together uh, these people from different ministries. So they had an effect on the political system even. Uh, so this is just to show how you can change uh, and how you can bring about change, not only at the civil society level or at the municipal level or so, but really at, at this is a state, yeah? Uh, just to add a, f a few things about the possible future, we have a lot of discussions now what ha will happen in so-called coal, coal regions, coal regions like Brandenburg or Northern Westphalia. And I, uh, in our mind, it's much better to include future councils to discuss uh, these things, how to, uh, to go on with a transformation process, which is absolutely necessary from sustainability and climate policy point of view, which has to be done very Strong, strongly, um, but of course you have to include all those who lose their jobs or who have no perspective in their regions, etc. And it's much better to have that. We were trying to do this in the rural area uh, ten years ago. There was, as you might remember, um, General Motors, Opel, um, um, a, a company, and that uh, was closed by General Motors in the United States. And then uh, there was this question, what happens to all this yeah, brain stuff, which is in Bochum? Yeah, and uh, nothing uh, was done uh, on the 
Municip municipal level or on the land, land level. So what you have there instead of Opel or Nokia, which then came, is now a DHL um, a re redistribution center with minimum wage. Mm. That is what is left from the engineering capacities in these fantastic regions. Yeah. And I thought it would have been much, much better to include people from Bochum and the whole region into a council like this and to, to get much more concrete and uh, livable results. I'll just came just to answer, or would you like to ask something in between? Because I just came back from, from the Lausitz where I can have a similar experience. Uh, the Lausitz is Lusatia, it's a region near here where uh, we have to phase out coal and there are lots of problems and there's now a coal commission. And basically all the, it was the beginning of this coal coalition and lots of ministers were there and prime ministers of the different lender and so on. And, the, and the, all the sort of speeches and even the people were just saying, we need money first and we need employment. But employment meaning the same type of employment as we always had. Uh, so there was no idea about how this region could live in, in 30 or 40 years other than, uh, you know, establishing another form of industry. Replacing one sort of industrial employment with another industrial employment. Uh, and, and the people were very sort of also um, frustrated uh, by all the sort of structural change which has taken place. And there was no sort of, um, uh, of feeling like we can take the future in our hand and perhaps uh, thinking about other ways of, of employment, other ways of work, uh, of gainful work and um, finding uh, sort of uh, different ways of, of thinking the future. Of course, you need some sort of, uh, um, how can I say, uh, um, you, you need some sort of ideas, but there are lots of sort of small companies, for example, which have some sort of ideas. They're not big, you know, and everything is, is in a very old paradigm. So in order to, to counterweigh this sort of thinking and to link sort of democracy was an old form of capitalism. You need really different ways of, of thinking about it. And it has to be, to my mind, to come from below, but connected to institutions. Thank you. Another point back there. Maybe exactly to this, to this point. We have now this coal commission, right? And it is representing all kinds of interests because we have a heterogeneous field of interests and of visions, right? There is the coal miner association and the industry and the greens and everything, right? What is the difference? How would you, with respect of your Zukunftsrat, make a difference to that one? And, and only I to add a provocative question a little bit. I Maybe, because this is a representative for all directions. Isn't it a promise that the whole thing will not be very visionary because everything will be balanced? Wouldn't it be, it's a provocative question. I don't, <laughs> I'm taking it not too seriously, but just to make thinking. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you need someone, some leading figures in the region, yes, of mm -hmm. course, that say, I have a vision. I'm not representative because I have a clear vision of the future and this will come, I will compensate you, blah, blah, blah. But I can only put it through if I have a visionary person and something like that. No representation, but a good idea mm -hmm. that's very, Provocative, maybe. Thank but there, you. there are two questions. I absolutely agree. I think that these types of, of commission goes nowhere. This is the, the lowest common denominator. I have been inside, uh, for example, the um, Nuclear Waste Commission. I can tell you how it works. It works. It's a disaster. The operational system, how it works inside, is exactly how you represent it. And this is not the way I would see a council, because my the experience I have is if you take citizens which don't represent any sort of interest, exactly the opposite. They try to f the common good is in the middle, and they try to come up with ideas instead of uh, you know representing and keeping repeating what they have to represent. Yeah? So that's what I meant by the biggest common denominator. But you're right, the problem with the coal is that if they're going, there is going to be participation, not as I think I would like it to be, but there's going to be some sort of participation. Yeah? But the, the danger is that let the people participate about their own future somehow and do nothing with the results because the coal commission is here and the people are there. So what you need, in fact, yes, you need some sort of leadership also, because you need, a, to my mind, a steering group yeah, of people from, from these places, but also from the, the two lenders, in order to come up 
to have a, a narrative uh, which is much stronger, a vision which is much stronger, to be able to push forward uh, within the, even the federal level in politics. So you need some sort of translation and to make sure that it's, it's not going nowhere, but it, it becomes a, a power. Yeah? Playing the, sorry. Excuse me, there's an ex post illustration for that. If you think about Stuttgart 21, which was uh, uh, yeah, the transformation of Stuttgart station into a bigger one, <laughs> connected to the European level, etc., you have this, all this in mind. There were a lot of protests on the street, and then there was this decision, we will uh, transform Stuttgart 21 into a station of the next century. And all kinds of ideas were on the table, how it should be done and what, how much it was cost. And this was a disaster. At first, the ideas were, were, were very weak. And on the other hand, it was much more costly, as they said. And then already this dialogue organized by Heiner Geisler, a German uh, retired politician, brought up a lot of better ideas about a mobility concept for this region, even on the European level, if you, if you want. And now you have all kind of post, ex post uh, corrections to this master plan. And I think the master plan will fail, not just in Berlin, as you know, with your airport, but also in Stuttgart. This is much too expensive. Nobody can go on with that. And if there, even on the expert level, yeah, but more so on the level of citizens, concerned citizens. It's not it just that it's our participation. It's not just an uh, 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 everybody participation. It needs some qualification to be part of it. You have to qualify yourself, not by merits or by, uh, by, by, by education or so, but you, you qualify yourself in this project. You, you get very serious and you, 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 you have a lot of empathy for uh, positions of others. This is what we're talking about. And even that would have created a much better concept for Stuttgart than we have today. Playing the devil's advocate. Isn't what is really needed to have less participation and not more? Because like looking from China, at our examples, our democracies don't deliver. Um, we have a lot of talk, talking going on, but long-term visions, it's really hard to implement. And I'm really skeptical if um, a group of, of citizens will be able to have this long-term thinking and abstract them from their own uh, interests and, and benefits that they are striving for. Um, <laughs> exactly. We had that discussion with the young politicians just, just before that. How can you educate people to think about the common goods and not about their own? And climate change is the best example mm. um, that people focus on what is happening now and not so much on what is happening in 100 years. So there's no solution. First of all, I think that China is a very bad example. Uh, <laughs> we have a... <laughs> Uh, and we have, a, we have some people in our institute who, are, who have lived many years in China and, and work on China and who can give me very good analysis of what's really happening there and it's really our projections on China. Uh, and I don't, it's, it's notwithstanding autocracy that something happens, only because we don't deliver. It's not a question that it, autocracy is good, first thing. Second thing is that we don't need less participation, but we, know, we need to know when it, it's good and what, when it's really needed and what for. So I would give you um, some sort of credits saying that, first of all, we need to understand what needs to be transformed and what doesn't need to, transform, need to be transformed. I think that f for this conference, we got a very good um, discussion paper by um, oh no, Burmeister. Burmeister, exactly, um, who, who said that we need to understand what's the core and what's the value of democracy, what we need to keep, and what instruments or what the, the sort of, I would say, what the software is and how, how we would come about. And if democracy about self is about self-determination uh, and about you know how to come up with uh, societies that can uh, that can be sustainable then we need to understand what forms we need and I think we definitely need participation to this and I can say that um, what uh, we just stated about the non sort of uh, non-selfish or selfish citizen uh, my experience is something totally different. For the BMU, um, now BMUB, namely the Environmental Ministry, 
um, I conceived of uh, different um, councils, uh, citizen councils, to come up with input for the um, Umweltbundesplan, um, yeah, 2030. And what the city, what they were chosen by lot in different cities in Germany, people who were unpolitically in part, who said, I've never even voted, yeah? And they sat down together for two days and came up with questions and with, with, with what they think the, the government in Germany should do for the environment. And these, the, the questions and what came out of there is now, you can read it. It's within the program of the ministry uh, and it's much more radical than what the minister came out of. So people are able to think in a, in a non-selfish way, probably in an easier manner once they have the room to do so. So I think everything is how you conceive this kind of discussions in order to be able to come up with this. Thank you. We have a last question. We have three minutes left, so very short. Yeah, uh, Paulina Fröhlich from the Progressive Zentrum. Um, Klaus Legewe, you said in your introduction that we should defend institutions, and I do agree with you. At the same time, I feel weird about institutions when I think about the willingness in order to transform into a participatory process, because I feel that the institutions, or the big ones we talk about, have a rather lower willingness in order to order or to open up for participatory and civic participation processes. So um, how shall I defend institutions against right-wing populists, for example, while I feel like that the struggle at the same time which is going on is with the institutions themselves when we think about the future and democ democracy? Thank you. I completely understand your irritation, frustration, dilemma. It's true, it's mine too. <laughs> A very simple word, it's about freedom. It's not just about equality in democracy, it's about freedom of action. And I think in this particular moment we are in, in Europe, but all over the world, we simply have to fight for that. It's no longer a discourse, it's no longer a proposal, it's no longer um, a kind of, okay, we have a better vision of that. And No, we have to fight for that. The situation is very serious we're in. Yeah? Not just in Poland, it's, it, it can happen here. Yeah, and uh, as it is like this, um, uh, we have to put more effort into making our, our voice uh, um, present at uh, this level of, 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 of elite uh, politics. They are desperate, they need us, they don't know it, but they're desperate and, and we, we, we should never give up yeah, building this bridge, but it's not about just confirming old style, old school democracy. No, it's creating a new one. Democratization, as I said in the beginning, is a process and you, you, you're always going on with democratization and here it's the next step. Now it's kind of perverted into a populist identitarian movement which goes to, uh, which will lead to autocracy. So we have to fight against it and, and make us here. <laughs> Beautiful final words. Thank you so much for an inspiring discussion. I've really had fun, I hope you too. So, thank you so much. <laughs>